Welcome to the second Military History Verbalized podcast and today we talk about what 21st century staff officers actually do. Today we have a special guest, Saul from the Australian Defense Force and thank you for being here, Saul. It's my absolute pleasure. Um, I'm a big fan of your videos. Thank you. Could you give a short introduction on your educational and professional background so that we know who you are? So I attended a military school in Sydney, um, the King School. Following that, uh, I went to the Australian National University, uh, where I studied a Bachelor of International Relations. And then I joined the Army through the Direct Officer Entry Program, which is through the Royal Military College, uh, Dundrum. This differs from uh, the other way that you can join the Army as an Army officer, which is to go to the Defence Forces University, which is called ADFA. Uh, prior to attending RMC. Um, I graduated from RMC in 2010, the end of 2010, and then conducted postings to signals units, to uh, combat service support battalion, to a combat engineer regiment, uh, and then to various training institutions where uh, I'm currently on a, a second posting to a, to a training institution. And I need to give a disclaimer, uh, which is that uh, any views that I present here are entirely my own. They're not representative of official positions of the Department of Defence, the Army, or the Australian Defence Force. I think that covers it. Excellent. So let's get into this. Um, you are quite experienced around the whole staff, military staff operations and everything. So what is a staff in general in military terms? Can you give us a broad overview? In the broadest terms, uh, the staff support a commander. So militaries invest something called authority or that we call command authority uh, into commanders, which gives them uh, absolute authority over um, their subordinates to achieve certain missions within certain legal parameters. Staff officers don't have command authority, but what they do is assist the commander in the discharge of his duties, essentially by planning for him and communicating for him and that sort of thing. So so basically they're advising him and supporting him that he can make the right decisions without uh, caring about the minor details, basically. That's correct. So they, they, they deal with the... So if we were to conceptualize the problem in terms of uh, coming to understand the problem, they get into the detail of what problem actually needs to be solved, what the relevant parameters are around the, the problem. They collect information to inform a decision. They present uh, a variety of possible decisions to a commander. The commander reaches a decision, and then the staff will communicate his decision in the form of orders to subordinates to enact his will or her will, as the case may be. Austrian military, I know we ha we had a staff, and we had back then. I think we had six different kinds of staff sections. Is this, but I, I recently read up, I think it's way more now. So what is the uh, common approach here? So the common approach is something called the continental staff system, which actually originates from uh, Austria slant Prussia. I think Austria has the slightly earlier claim to it, but um, Prussia is certainly the, the uh, country that popularized it. The continental staff system divides the staff into 10 different areas with sub areas underneath them, uh, which go from, uh, which are numbered from zero through to nine, because like all good scientists, we start by counting at the number zero, not the number one. Um, and this is a product of the concept of military endeavor as a science and not an art or an occupation. The zero branch is the commander and the commander's uh, direct specialist staff. So one would expect, for example, to find underneath the commander like a legal, these days at least, like legal um, advice. Uh, you'd probably find a chaplain under there, that sort of thing in the in the what we would call the zero branch. The one branch is devoted to personnel, uh, so the human aspects of, well, humans who fight wars and that sort of thing. The two branches, the intelligence branch. Um, which deals with enemy dispositions, intentions, capabilities, that sort of thing. The three branches, the operations branch, whose function is to plan out the um, achievement of the mission, whatever it may be, or the operation as it may be. 
So that's the three branch. The four branch is logistics, uh, which handles all matters of materiel, uh, munitions, equipment, transportation of those things, as well as health. Am I missing anything? Maintenance of equipment. I think that about covers it. The five branch is plans, which is similar to the operations branch, who handles out, who handles the um, the the conduct of the current, the current or the very near future operations of the of the of the organization. Whereas the plans branch will develop firstly plans for known operations or known things that the organization will be doing, but who also develops contingency plans for things which may eventuate, but which also may not. Six is signals, seven, and now we're starting to strain me. Seven is training, right? So following training, uh, eight is finance and contracts, and nine is uh, CIMIC or civil military cooperation, which is the interaction between military forces and civilian forces, both ones that are actually doing something and ones that just happen to be in an area of operations. And then another question would be interesting. So at which level you start to have a staff? I mean, you have it, I think, already. Do you can say on a company level, do you have a staff or does it start at battalion level or, or brigade level? So where do you really talk about a staff? So that's actually a really interesting question. Traditionally, you would only see staff beginning at the lowest level capable of combined arms operations, which uh, once upon a time, or at least when this was originally envisaged or conceived, that was at the division level. Um, in the time since, uh, militaries have pushed combined arms operations to lower and lower levels. I mean, originally, for example, the, the term general officer refers to an officer who is able to command across multiple specializations within an army so that they are a generalist, they can uh, fight the combined arms battle. However, militaries have now pushed combined arms command well below the, um, the divisional level, through the brigade level, down through the unit level, and now right even in some cases to the subunit level. Certainly within, depending on the complexity of the organization, you'll start to see it at the subunit level, so the company level, Sorry, I'm using Commonwealth terminology, but at the subunit level, you'll start to see um, <clears throat> a limited staff. You may see a, a, a three officer, like an operations officer, and you could conceive if you really wanted to the two IC of a company as an S1, but that would that's a bit of a stretch since they have command responsibilities. At the unit level, certainly you'd see in most large or complicated units, which are designed to have that are designed to be task grouped to so to have attachments given to them that are not of the same mustering. You definitely at that point you'd see not just one person in in the three cell, but you'd see probably two to three people. So you'd have a three, a three three, and a three five, uh, because we can add numbers after the initial number to designate sub functions. You would also almost certainly see an S4, so someone in charge of planning the logistics of the organization. And you'd see uh, an S1, who is in the Commonwealth system, nearly always the adjutant. Uh, you'd see, if you're lucky, an S2, depending on whether your military has a lot of intelligence officers to spare. Uh, you wouldn't generally see an S5, but you'd see an S6. Uh, and you might see an S7, but you wouldn't see an 8 or 9. By the time you get to brigade level, you will have multiple people working in each of those sub-functions, at least in the ABCA context, so the Australia, British, Canada, America context. You, you definitely see um, like a full staff by the time you get to the brigade level. Okay, a short question. Um, unit versus subunit. So a subunit is basically a company and below and the unit is battalion and above? That's correct. So a subunit is a company size group. Uh, we have... And this is again a, a Commonwealthism, but we have multiple types of subunits. So <clears throat> the the three archetypical ones are a battery, um, a company, and a squadron. A squadron denotes a mounted subunit. A battery uh, denotes an artillery subunit, and a company devote, uh, denotes a dismounted subunit. And the other interesting thing is that a a battery or a squadron will always be inside a regiment, whereas a company will always be inside a battalion. Uh, I don't know if it's the same for you guys. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that that's the that's the problem with Commonwealth and non Commonwealth, because um, regiment is bigger than a battalion, but not in the Commonwealth thing. I think this is this is really complicated. Uh, 
yes, no, I'm quite familiar with the uh, I'm quite familiar with the, the 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 disparity in terminology, particularly frustrating of the American who mix what we would call administrative groupings, so like regiment, battalion, um, squadron, company, etc. They they mix them with uh, terms that we use for task organizations like platoon group, combat team, battle group, which are the equivalent of, you know, like battle group, comfort group, that sort of thing. But they mix them with regimental term, terms. So you get like a regimental combat team. And that is just, that is, that is like a contradiction of terms. Like it, it makes no sense. And they do it all over the place. Oh, I just, it does my head in. I can't imagine. I, I only, I always, when I read about organizations, it's always, yeah, but back then it was an administrative unit and not an operation unit yet and everything. And I was like, do I really want to dig into this? Okay, since now we have a pretty good understanding of the general thing, how a staff works and the organization, what really interesting is to me, um, what does a staff officer actually do in a more like in a daily life? Because you, you assist the command and everything and you do organize and, and you look up stuff and everything and you advise him, but what does this actually mean in in real life basically so, so so what happens on a daily basis or weekly basis mainly so i'll uh i'll discuss at the brigade level and below because that's where i've had the the most direct exposure i'll talk firstly about what the three shop does because what an s3 or a g3 does um in large part sets the sets the priorities for the other um the other elements of the staff what the three does is assess things that need to be done, produce ways that they can do them, in some way seek a decision from the commander who is actually responsible for it occurring, and then turn what planning they've done into a fully fleshed out plan and then write orders that either the S3, the S3 in Commonwealth organisations at the brigade level is called the brigade major or the BM, which is, again, a, a fairly traditional term, um, will then either sign it himself uh, for the commander, which is a feature common to common to militaries that have been influenced by the German army, uh, or give it to the commander to sign. Either way, at the end of the day, the staff prepare orders, which the commander more or less says yes or no to. And if he says no to it, there's probably things he wants changed. Although that's, that tends to be the exception rather than the rule. So what the staff essentially does is uh, acting on guidance from the commander, uh, produce a plan that then his subordinates will carry out. What in practice all of this means is that they will either receive superior orders or they will begin to um, conduct planning on things that they know that they need to do. They'll assess what needs to be done through some kind of decision-making process where they'll carry out an appreciation of the terrain on which they need to operate, uh, the things that they need to achieve, what they have to achieve it, and what factors might prevent them from doing it to generate a number of ways that they could achieve it, uh, which they will then present to the commander. So engage in a kind of planning process where they'll come to understand what they know and what they don't know, present it to the commander to make a decision, and then turn that decision into a fully fleshed out plan with a set of orders which direct subordinate units to carry that action out. So what that means is a lot of Microsoft Excel and a lot of <laughs> Microsoft Word at either end of the either end of the problem, um, and perhaps PowerPoint in between to try and extract a decision from a commander. The other uh, sections of the staff will conduct similar actions. If you imagine that as a loop, uh, imagine the other sections of the staff as carrying out smaller loops that are attached to that loop that occur at different you know, parts of it to develop plans and that sort of thing. So a lot of analysis, uh, some persuasion, um, and then if it's a good staff, um, a, a good ability to communicate um, to communicate plans, probably in written form. So, okay, let's say we are on brigade level. So you, you would then basically, for instance, you need to attack a position. The brigade gets the higher order, okay, attack this position. So you would then basically plan, okay, we, we use these battalions and this we keep, keep this attack and this one, for instance, is in reserve. And then you would 
basically outline the, the timing when what will happen and what will be the follow-up plans. And is this correct or is this? Uh, so that's, that's, that's partially correct. Uh, the follow-up plans would be something done by the, the, the five branch. So, so starting, starting from the very beginning, um, so on receipt of orders, there'll be some kind of a, because the staff will be physically located in a location, there'll be some kind of command post drill that enables people within the staff to understand that um, direction has been received and that sort of thing. Uh, what they will then do is they will conduct an appreciation, they'll conduct an analysis of what it is they've been told to do, what, what are we actually being told to do. Um, they will then, so before we even start looking at units and the rest of it, they will then conduct um, an analysis of the uh, area in which they need to to do the things. The two shop is principally responsible for uh, having a detailed understanding of the area in which you know something is occurring. Normally, within a brigade uh, two shop, you'll have in addition to the S two, who's normally an intelligence major, um, he will have a number of subordinate staff officers working for him. Um, and he will also have a, a mapping cell of some sort or like a geospatial imagery cell, that, that sort of thing, uh, who will have or who one would expect to have a much higher um, degree of understanding about uh, where you actually are and where you're going and that sort of thing from, a, from, a, from the perspective of how it will affect you and the, you know, the adversary. The, once the terrain and what needs to be done are sufficiently understood. The uh, staff will engage in understanding both what forces are available to them to achieve the mission and what forces are available to the enemy and what the enemy might do to prevent that from occurring. Once they have an understanding of all of those things, they'll then generate a number of different ways that they could achieve uh, what they've been told to do. While this is occurring, the two shot will do the same thing for the enemy. So the two shot will generate possible ways that the enemy could uh, achieve what they think the enemy's mission is at the same time. And once the courses of action are sufficiently developed for both sides, you'll engage in some kind of, um, uh, we'll call it a comparison activity, but it's it's a kind of war game where, Kriegspiel. yeah, it is Kriegspiel. It is, it is literally Kriegspiel, although the term is not, not, in common use, but yeah, it's Creechville, um, where we'll then compare uh, different enemy courses of action to different possible friendly courses of action. Uh, the purpose of this is not to determine whether courses of action work or not. The, the purpose is actually primarily to determine how to improve given courses of action, with the expectation being that all of the course of action courses of action that make it to this stage should have already been sufficiently checked that if they weren't going to work, if they were not feasible, the acronym that we use is um, FASD, so uh, feasible, acceptable, suitable, and discernible. Uh, the last one is probably the interesting one for this. The courses of action need to be sufficiently different from each other that we can learn something from each of the ones that occur. Um, once we've engaged in that and we've made the modifications that we think that we need to based on um, possible unforeseen enemy action, that sort of thing, uh, we then have something sufficiently robust that we can give it to the commander to make a decision. Once the commander makes a decision, uh, we then add any further details that we need based on his guidance or based on gaps that we left in order to, to conduct the appreciation quickly enough and then turn it into orders to be carried out. So to go back to your example, there's a hill that we've been told to attack or whatever. The first thing we're going to do is determine, you know, where we are, where the hill is, what's between the two, what terrain surrounds the hill. Then we're going to um, ask ourselves, have we actually been told to take the hill? Is there something else that we've been told to do as well? Are there other things that we need to do in order to take the hill um, that are sort of necessary conditions for the hill to be taken? Uh, that while they may not have been um, articulated specifically in orders, are nonetheless essential things that must occur for the hill to be taken. After those things have occurred, we then say, well, what enemy is on the hill? What might the enemy do to prevent us from taking the hill? What other forces are near the hill? How will the enemy react to us taking the hill, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? And then we'll say, hey, well, you know, we've got, say, three manoeuvre units under us. So in the Australian context, two infantry battalions and an um, armoured cavalry regiment of some sort with 
uh, a gun regiment in support, a combat engineer regiment rolling around, um, some kind of command support unit rolling around, you know, electronic warfare, all the rest of it, uh, combat service support unit that's going to make all of their stuff work to attack it. We say we've got these things. What are the different ways that we could use them to take the hill and do all the other things that we've identified that we have to do? So we say, hey, maybe we'll go archetypically, we'll go two up, one back. So two units in the assault, uh, one in, we'll call it reserve. But really, if you're two up, one back, you don't have a reserve. You've got a, uh, what's the term for it? Their purpose is simply to, to reinforce the attack. To have a true reserve, you kind of need four maneuver units, but that's, a, that's neither here nor there, at least for two up, one back. Uh, so there's one. We're going to go two up, one back. We're just going to go up the guts with you know lots of smoke. And then we go, well, how else could we do this? Well, there's a hill nearby. Maybe we can put one of our maneuver units on the hill to uh, conduct an attack by fire or a support by fire to enable the other two units to achieve break-in. So we go uh, one in support by fire, one up, one back, um, to achieve break and clear the position. Uh, so that's the second one. And then normally you kind of you're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel by the time you get to the to trying to generate a third sort of way of taking the hill. So maybe for the third one we drop illumination rounds on the backside of the position and it's going to distract the enemy and they're going to fucking turn around or something. And at the moment that they turn around, we're going to dazzle them with flashlights on the front of every infantry, infantryman's rifle and they'll just fucking surrender. And so that's our third course of action. <laughs> so... <laughs> so once we've got those three courses of action, we need to make sure that um, all of the elements of them are sufficiently well understood that we can compare them to the different things that the enemy might do. So uh, based on our intelligence cells' understanding of uh, enemy doctrine, enemy tactics, that sort of thing, they will generate a number of ways that the enemy may seek to hold the hill. So maybe they have a security position forward, um, which is intended to fall back once it reaches contact. Maybe they've actually allocated their um, – they've, they've cut their tanks away from whatever organisation it is and their tanks are sitting in a hide with the intention of conducting a, a counterattack once we're decisively engaged. Maybe they're going to turn, turn all their torches on to, you know, to dazzle us with whatever and make us surrender. The point is that once we have those, once we have – we, we aim for three of our own courses of action, and that's pretty common across um, most Western military forces. And once we have at least two well-developed enemy courses of action, um, we'll then compare each of the friendly courses of action to the enemy courses of action in order to see how the two interact. Um, typically, uh, and when we compare it, when we're learning how they interact, we're, we're doing it for the purpose of understanding what changes must be made to the friendly courses of action to, to make sure that they don't you know, immediately fail. So, for example, uh, a serious question that we need to ask is what happens if every infantryman turns on his torch and uh, the enemy doesn't surrender? You know, what happens then? And maybe we say, hey, um, maybe this one won't work. Maybe we should trash it. But maybe we go, hey, we can, we're still going to be far enough away from the enemy position that they can, you know, not do the torch thing after they turn their torches on and we can just go to another plan that will actually work if they don't surrender, you know. As an example, uh, once the commander has reached a decision after the modifications are made from the war game, then it actually needs to be turned into something that units can use. That is in the form of orders which are unique but similar across um, Western militaries. Uh, I can't I can't speak for non English speaking ones, but certainly in the English speaking ones, it'll be the the old five paragraph for, uh, orders format. So situation, mission, execution, uh, administration, and logistics, command, and signals. Uh, within the execution phase, each subunit, correction, each unit, each subordinate element will be given a series of things that they must do. Um, and also within that, you'll have coordinating instructions that tell them for which areas they are responsible, uh, by what time they must do certain things, uh, how they are to link up with other organisations on the battlefield, how they're interact, uh, to interact with them and that sort of thing. Okay, so other things that are occurring while that occurs. So the five cell. Uh, so we should probably talk about the four cell first. So the four cell, so the one cell, we'll go all the way back. The one cell at this point, their doctrinal function, whether or not actual S1s and actual units do this or not, is a separate thing, but that's a trainingism probably, uh, are meant to be working out how many people are likely to die in the upcoming attack. Uh, 
they should then be organising reinforcements for those people or at least understanding uh, what gaps will be left by those who can't be reinforced. The foreshop will be doing two things, um, three things actually. It will be uh, ensuring that uh, all of the elements who will engage in the taking of the hill are sufficiently um, supplied in order to do so, that they have enough working equipment, enough working munitions, blah, 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 to actually carry out the plan that, or the plans at this stage that are being conceived. The second thing they'll be doing is they'll be working out how uh, battlefield, battlefield clearance will occur. So battlefield clearance is not a, a combat task. It's actually a combat service support task, a logistics task. Um, battlefield clearance is the act of uh, salvaging, repairing known equipment, et cetera, uh, repurposing enemy equipment, backloading casualties that have occurred, um, mortuary affairs, dealing with those who have died, and anything else? Um, no, I think it's about it, recovering vehicles that are you know, able to be repaired, which is kind of salvage. And then the third thing they'll be doing is working out subsequent sustainment activities that need to occur to bring the organisation back to a state in which it can fight. So what needs to occur for that to happen, how long it will take, how long will it be before subsequent plans can be enacted before the organisation can do something other than defend the hill that it's taken, which leads us neatly to what the five cell is doing. So the five cell should be planning multiple what we call, right, so within an operational plan, you have sequentials and branches, branches, branches and sequences. So we'll have branch plans, so contingency plans where, we, where the opportunity cost of the branch plan means that we can't carry out the other branches, or we have sequences where um, they can be carried out one after another and they don't incur an opportunity cost that prevents that prevents the alternates from occurring. Okay. They'll be, or uh, they should be. A branch plan basically means um, that you have a, a question like, if we have still enough troops, then we attack, or if we don't have, then we dig in, for instance. No, a branch plan would be like, after we take hill A, uh, we can then either take hill B or hill C, but we can't take both. Whereas, uh, and you know, after that, we'll be in a different branch of the plan. Um, and we can't return to the original branch and we also can't return to the C branch. Whereas a sequel would be like, after we take Hill A, um, we can either establish a main defensive position on Hill A and then we could either do B or C branches. Um, but by doing uh, A, by doing the sequel, we haven't denied the possibility of doing the branches. So it's, it's a way of conceptualizing like opportunity cost and like operational structures. So sequels can be carried out sequels don't stop you from doing anything else um, except insofar as at the time that you're doing them you're not doing something else whereas branches by necessity um deny you the ability to carry out all of the other branches so okay. branches are mutually exclusive basically and se sequence exactly that, that's, okay. sorry that's precisely what i was saying sorry the the whiskeys are uh, um right so the five shops working out uh plans for that as well potentially as contingency plans. A good fire shop already has like a stack of possible plans that require nothing more than a commander's signature to become an operation. Certainly that is what the, uh, the Prussian staff um, were good at in sort of the 19th century and that's, that's their excellent staff work is the reason why the rest of the world adopted the common staff system um, that they had like literally sitting on shelves and shelves and shelves operational plans for like everything that could happen. So that's your five shops, six shops working out signals, like radios and computers and stuff. Uh, One question I have about the whole element now, we were on brigade level now. So yep. how, how does the synchronization with, with the battalion occur? Because they also have, have the staff. And the, is it more that the brigade works out everything and then gives the, the order to the, to the battalion and they work it out on their level again? Or is it basically synchronized? Is there some delay? How, how does this work together? In the There's a delay. That's, yeah, so that's actually a really excellent question. There's a delay at each subsequent level. So the, it's, a, it's a maxim, it's a planning guideline, and it's rarely followed. It's followed all too infrequently, but it's something that is called the one-third, two-thirds rule. Um, it's definitely used in all ABCA militaries. I can't talk about NATO or packed countries. <clears throat> but it's the idea that any plans that any staff work that you do, any analysis, any creation of orders, et cetera, 
must take up no more than um, one third of the time available before the execution of the task is due to commence. And once you reach one third of that time, you, you, you should have already delivered orders to the subordinate unit because they will also carry out an appreciation of the orders and then deliver subsequent orders to their subordinates. Is that followed? Uh, not as much as it should be, um, as you can possibly imagine. The, the process is repeated at, at every level from, or is hypothetically repeated at every, every level from a core down to uh, a kind of appreciation like this occurs at the platoon level, but the staff there is a single person. Um, being the commander, he has no staff. Um, if he's clever, he, he may get a senior enlisted person to like help him with some parts of it. Okay. So we have a basic idea now of what a staff officer does and how the staff operates in a wartime situation. Now, I'm quite curious, what do you do, guys, in peace? I will ring fence the S1, who does administration and other things like administration, I don't know, during peacetime. Um, the other sub-functions should be so the the five shop should be developing contingency plans so plans for things which may not occur but may that can be enacted like we discussed before the uh two three and four and six uh shops need to be and seven man seven comes back into it training should be um should be doing more or less what they do during wartime but for training activities so both to train themselves and to plan and conduct the training for subordinate elements uh i don't know how to expand on it past that really um so the operation cell for example instead of planning uh how to take the hill for example would be planning how to have a maneuver element underneath a, manu a maneuver subordinate um, train to take a hill, for example. Uh, so how do we get them to the training area? How do we, what are their training objectives when they're at the training area? All the rest of it, and then, you know, deliver subordinate uh, orders to subordinates in a similar way. Um, probably the, the key difference <laughs> would be that the amount of what we call staff churn, um, which is the ability of staff to generate work for other people in the staff and for other staffs that doesn't actually produce any training or war fighting function um, that exists only to make more work for other staff officers is vastly increased in peacetime. So tasks with no appreciable function, analysis with no appreciable function, et cetera, uh, work for other people will be created and you'll get these kind of vicious loops where people just make pointless work for each other. One one final big big topic I have is basically um, what are common misconceptions first off among civilians and later on uh, among the military about what staff officer or staff work actually is or is not. So I would be amazed if civilians even knew that staff officers staff officers were staff officers existed um, within the military. Uh, perceptions tend to exist that staff officers are uh, uh nerds uh, uh not even that the, just that they're dislocated that they're that they're not uh aware of what is going on with actual people doing things and while the degree of truth exists in that that tends to be because if that is the case and it generally isn't the case and where i've observed problems with um direction that staff officers are giving it has more to do with how the direction is communicated and it's misinterpreted and that sort of thing and then people start doing pointless things going on goat rodeos and just wasting soldiers time um but where that isn't the case where it's not just because their plan wasn't crap um their orders were crap or their communication was poor or was misinterpreted or whatever it's because um the information that they've received is incorrect or out of date or whatever someone someone's been generally lazy to some degree at a subordinate level and they provided information that's that's out of date and incorrect to people that have then generated a plan based on that that then mercilessly fuck soldiers around because it was incorrect to begin with staff officers in my experience even the ones i don't like even the ones that i really don't want to like produce plans that are fundamentally workable and that are fundamentally sound based on the information that they've received 
where problems arise um, is when they receive information that's fundamentally wrong or when the direction that they've produced is fundamentally misinterpreted. Um, I, I guess what I'm really saying is that staff officers are your friends. Like, it's, it's someone else fucking you around. It's probably untrue. Yeah, and so it's basically fun. garbage in, garbage out. Yes, uh, that, that is actually uh, exact. We say shit in, shit out, but yes. Yeah, it's the same. It's precisely that. That's a much better way of putting it. Um, I can't think what else. I, I guess if you really wanted to be a staff officer, a modern staff officer, get like really good at Microsoft Excel. Um, <laughs> so it's the pinnacle of human achievement. I, I maintain that. It makes everyone a programmer. But it, it, genuinely, though, it's capacity to, to sort, organize, rearrange, et cetera, um, information and to perform rudimentary analysis on that, that information is just incredible. Like it, it's ridiculous the amount that can be achieved with Microsoft Excel. <laughs> Dan, so thank you very much for this very interesting insights and thank you for, for being on, on the podcast. It's been my uh, absolute pleasure. I'd love to talk to you again about other things. Don't forget to uh, drink lots of whiskey so that you grow up into a big, strong man. <laughs> I don't drink. Uh, not, you, but, <laughs> not you, but your listeners. Well, then you should never trust anyone who doesn't drink and doesn't smoke. <laughs> okay. <laughs>